It's good to be here and sharing the Word of God. And um, we're going to look at something unusual just for a minute. Just imagine that uh, at some point in our God's existence, there was an, an eternity prior to everything that he had created. Right? So, so there was nothing around except God for eternity before that. That's a difficult concept for us to understand. We have a beginning and an end. So when you think back and, and it's just it's something that we would not do well to continue to think about because we would lose our minds essentially. But we can take it by faith that prior to that time, there was just the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And within our triune God, there was continual expressions of love one to another and building one another up. What we are counseled to do by the words of Jesus and in scripture, they were doing amongst themselves. And that very thought to me reveals that it's not possible that there could be no Son and no Holy Spirit, only one Father. What would he be doing for eternity by himself before that? Love needs to be expressed to another being. It cannot just be contained. It's sustained and survives by expressing love to another. This is why we don't live forever because we don't have the innate capacity to express love. We don't have that love. It has to be given to us through God by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the kingdom of love of God, which is the kingdom of love, has been expanding ever since God started creating things and people and beings and planets. The entire universe was in harmony with God's love. But there came a time when one created being decided that he did not want to go along with God's order, with God's law. Lucifer decided that he wanted to be like God. He wanted to exercise the power of God, but didn't want to be like him. And there was a reason for that. He wanted to rule. There was a strange principle that was introduced into the universe that had never existed before. Sin, which separates from God, breeds selfishness, despises God, and the law of love. What was not immediately known by Lucifer was that separation from God and love results in certain irredeemable death. How is it even possible that a created being would have any chance to rule in God's place? Could he not think that what we just mentioned, that prior to his creation, he was the first created being, yes. there was nothing for an eternity? How would he not know that there is this wisdom beyond what he could ever even reach? And while he was a great being, while he had great wisdom, he could not compare to God, Christ, or the Holy Spirit in any way. Amen. One thing that we come to realize when we look at what Satan did, Lucifer at that time, is that sin begins to, begins to erode one's ability to reason. It causes us to become stupid. And we do things that just don't make sense, expecting other results. There is no power against God, period. But once the power of love was rejected by Lucifer, his ability to reason was gone. Even though Jesus pleaded with you, Lucifer, he ended up rejecting God's mercy and love. He became Satan, the liar and the murderer. 
With the rejection of God came the rejection of love, and when love is rejected, so is life. Because love, or God, is the source of life. By being deceiving, excuse me, by deceiving other angels to join with him, that effectively made him a liar and a murderer. Amen. They, all of them, chose to join together because that's what evil does. Wherever it finds evil, evil will join together and fight against the good. And they decided that they would make this war in heaven against God, against Jesus, against the other holy angels, against the Holy Spirit. And they ended up being evicted. Everything is important and valuable to God and his creatures. God thinks of everything, even down to the point that he, can, he knows the numbers on our head, yes. the hairs of our head, I should say. But when he's rejected, nothing be, is important to those who reject him except themselves. That's the most important thing, and they will do anything and everything they can to be important, to be um, worshipped. And so we see in the world today, everybody's trying in some way or another, some big ways, some small ways, to be worshipped, to be adored, to be liked. This is why social media is so popular. Ultimately, Satan and his followers were evicted. They were thrown down to this earth when it was void and without form. And then God created the, the earth, this planet, I should say, and ended up resting after his creation on the seventh day. He made man and woman and put them in his garden to take care of it. They were to continue in that love because that was a precious gift that he gave them. We think of, you know, Callaway Gardens, some of you may have been there, or some beautiful place where you know, man has created a wonderful garden or a zoo or something. And you see all these beautiful things that man has done. Nothing like that compares to what God gave to Adam and Eve. It was perfect. And they were given that beautiful gift, which is an expression of his love to them. And they were as to receive, when they received that love, they were to express it back to one another. And he told them, be fruitful and multiply. And then they would be, love would just expand more and more, just as God when he, in his creation, was an expression of his love, so they would can carry on in that love as well. And the purpose of this was to prove to the universe that Satan was a liar and a murderer. Yes. This planet, these people, Adam and Eve, and us, were chosen to prove that Satan was a liar and a murderer. As a result of that, our first parents failing though, we are suffering a lot. This planet is not what it should be or should have been. But during this time, those of us who remain faithful will have a reward that is unlike any other that nothing has seen in the universe has seen anything like this. We will be a privileged people because we in this fallen world and fallen condition have decided to reject Satan's lies and to join with Christ, God and the Holy Spirit and live in this world in his kingdom as though we were already there while being attacked here, persecuted and some of us put to death. Then one day, a strange thing that strange thing which happened in heaven occurred here in the Garden of Eden. Sin, which is, the express, is expressed in selfishness and was again made to appear like love. Satan tried to make selfishness look like love. That's what he always does. And our first parents accepted it. And it invaded their, house, their hearts like a virus, which they could not get rid of. There was nothing they could do to change themselves back to what they were. It just was not in their power to do that. The moment that happened, love left them. The vacuum was filled with selfishness and they became the enemies of God and they were destined to die. And Satan knew this. 
And he was happy about this because that's what evil does. It rejoices at others' bad fortune. But it didn't happen. They didn't die. Instead, Christ came looking for them to bring them back to love, to bring them back the love that they had lost out of their hearts. Something that God did for his angels uh, after the initial rebellion of Satan was offered to Adam and Eve. They received another probation. Instead of dying right there and then, a plan that was in the heart of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was revealed to them. Satan saw this too. And it was revealed to them through the sacrificial lamb. They had never seen death before. They had never seen blood before. Adam was instructed to shed the blood and take the life of the sacrificial lamb, which rep represented Jesus Christ and the manner in which he was going to remove sin from them and ultimately bring them back into harmony with God and the universe. Through the blood, sin was transferred out of them and onto the Lord, and he would die for their sins, the sins that they had repented of. This was the only way in which they could be forgiven the only way in which they could receive life and be transformed from being selfish to loving. And if they continued to live in that faith, continued to believe that what God said, that what Jesus said, what was promised to them would happen, that in the end they would be one day resurrected. They would receive immortal bodies they would be brought back to the Garden of Eden and they would live forever without sin, without death, without sickness. We have, this is a statement here that goes along with this. We have reason for ceaseless gratitude to God that Christ, by his perfect obedience, has won back the heaven that Adam lost through disobedience. Adam sinned and the children of Adam share his guilt and its consequences. But Jesus bore the guilt of Adam and all the children of Adam that will flee to Christ, the second Adam, may escape the penalty of transgression. Jesus regained heaven for man by bearing the test that Adam failed to endure, for he obeyed the law perfectly, and all who have a right conception of the plan of redemption will see that they cannot be saved while in transgression of God's holy precepts. They must cease to transgress the law and lay hold on the promises of God that are available for us through the merits of Christ. Amen. And this is what was offered to Adam and Eve and has been offered to every successive generation. The merits of Christ as received or, or revealed in the sacrificial lamb. And then when he came to this earth, they saw they rejected, but after a while, some of them began to receive. Some of them began to understand what God was all about, that this was an, the greatest expression that the universe had ever seen of God's love for man and what God was like. And when they began to understand it, men like Paul or Saul, who was a persecutor of Christians, and hated Christians, yes, yes. turned his life completely around and became a fool, as he said, for Jesus Christ. Amen. Not caring what anybody thought, not, not afraid to go anywhere. Uh, one place, at one time he wanted to go and speak to some people in a crowd and they said, don't go. We didn't let him go because they would tear him apart. He says, what do I care? I need to testify. Well, our first parents failed the first probation by eating of the tree of the good of knowledge, good knowledge and evil. They lost the capacity of love and the vacuum was filled with the attributes of selfishness. And they were helpless to change what was now a lifelong curse. They had to be removed from the Garden of Eden. They needed to be kept away from the tree of life 
And that was actually a blessing for them because now they would have to rely completely upon the Lamb of God in order to receive life. That avenue was removed from them. So now complete dependence is upon Jesus Christ. God's love has always been shed everywhere, just like the light from the sun. God is light and we live in darkness without him. Not until we come to the light can we see him. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the glorious light of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, shine unto them. While God's love is always radiating from him through Christ and the Holy Spirit, even the holy angels, Satan has a way of creating little clouds that hover over our head so that we don't see his love. We don't see the light and we begin to doubt. We begin to feel as though God really doesn't love me. How could he? After all, look at me. And we know how we are. We know every lie we've told. We may not be able to recall them all, but we know what we are. We know the things that we have done that we should. We, are, we know the things that we have. We wouldn't even dare tell anybody that we've thought or done. But God knows all of that. And so we know he knows that. And so there's this inborn um, propensity to avoid God. This is the carnal mind. And he doesn't want, Satan does not want us to see that God loves us. But God is just fully love. There's, there's no other, the Bible says there's no darkness in him at all. It's just pure love. Just completely. And that love is so powerful that we can't stand in its presence because of the selfishness and sin. We would be consumed. Love is power. When you think of Jesus on the cross, that's power. Because he had all of this power to come down from that cross or from the cross, just say, be gone, all of you. And it would have instantly happened. But the power of love held him upon that cross. He loved, he loved us so much that he didn't care what happened to us. Even if he would be separated forever, which he, what he was going for, he didn't care. Satan does not want us to see this love or the God's plan of salvation. He just wants us to live in darkness and doubt. But it is our privilege, our duty after this display of love to embrace it and let God's love guide us, yes. right? That love produces a love in us, which we can love others with and him with. And it creates a, a faith that is unbreakable. If God's love is fully in us and we exp express it to other people, we will have faith, the faith of Jesus, because it will be the Holy Spirit shedding abroad in our hearts the love of God. We can clearly understand how much God really wants to save us if we think about what took place at the cross. If we think about what we read in the Bible, a new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. Oh, Israel, Israel, you know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, how often would I call, I called you, I want you to come to me, but you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, void of love. Your hearts are emptied. He didn't say, I'm, you are desolate. Your house, the house of worship and the houses that you should have me in are desolate. That's not a good position to be in at all. We should be settled in this love, grounded, having no doubts whatsoever that God loves us and that we know what he has planned for us, 
we know what his word says, and we should be able to, in love, express that to other people, even if they hate us. What I want to do now is just go to, uh, turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. And I'm going to read just a little bit there, maybe starting at verse 7, just to see this love in action as Paul writes this. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. This is the desire of Paul and his companions. His desire and their desires was not to, let's see how great preachers we can become. Let's see how, much we, how many followers we can have. But we are praying for you. Our interest, our hearts are devoted toward you. Verse 10, why? That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness. And, oh sorry, verse 12, right? Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So we are made meet. This is saying that he has made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints who live in light. Those who have accepted Christ and lived their lives completely for him, we have been made fit to be among them and fit to be in heaven. Verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Amen. Now, Amen. let's not just think about what he's written to them. This is us. Amen. This is us. We have been translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. Amen. And this is what we need to keep in mind. And this essentially is how we should live. It's difficult for us to do that at times because this world is so invasive and Satan is always trying to interrupt our spiritual life and disconnect us. But if we live with the mind that this is just a life where I have the privilege of expressing God's love to everybody I come in contact with, that changes things a little bit. Rather than to say, well, what should I say to them? What Bible study can I give to them? That may come in time, but to express love, the love that God has for us is first and foremost. This is what we need to do. Now, of course, there's situations where there are people you're gonna meet where you need, you need to start with you know, scripture or studying with them right away. Everyone's at a different level, but it all should come from a heart of love. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, Amen. even the forgiveness of sins. And this, I can't stop thanking God for this precious gift of his blood. Because through his blood, my sins are taken away from me. Amen. Through his blood, I can place all of the corruption, the sin, the selfishness, the death that I've earned and deserved up in that blood, which is essentially the blood of Christ. And he has taken and is in heaven working to cleanse it ultimately, but giving me his righteousness, giving me his strength, giving me his Holy Spirit, giving us this gift. All of us have this available to us. And for us to say, oh, and you've heard it, and I probably have said it myself too, I have a long way to go. You know, it's not a matter of how long we need to go, how far. It's a matter of accepting what Christ has done for us, Amen. right? Amen. The moment, the moment that we repent, that moment 
we are whole and complete in him. We don't have to keep on crying and, 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 and groveling and begging. No. He says, I love you with an everlasting love. That's not going to stop. What we do does not stop him from loving us. It may stop us from loving him or believing, but it doesn't stop us. Stop him, excuse me. Verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That's how we started it. Before everything was created, there was Christ. There was the Father. There was the Holy Spirit for an eternity. Just this sphere of love, just getting more and more powerful, growing and growing, and then that begins to expand through their creation. And we are part of that creation. Amen. We are an expression of God's love. Amen. And we should allow that love to permeate our entire being and express it to other people, specifically in our own homes to start. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that, all, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. So we will lack nothing when we come to Christ. And having, be, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled, and this is important, we are the ones that had the problem with God. He didn't have a problem with us. The Bible says, we repeated it this morning, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We were the ones that didn't love him. We were the ones that rejected him, that wanted him to stay out of our lives and let us be. But he said, no, if I do that, you don't understand. You will cease to exist. You will destroy one another. I have a plan for you. You might not like it at first, but you will learn to love it later. Verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Is that talking about us or is that angels? That's us. Can you imagine that? That in this body that we will be, Christ will present us to the Father holy unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. In other words, God will look at us and say, I find nothing wrong with you. Nothing. You are the expression of the love I have given to you. You are perfect through Christ. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. <laughs> Amen. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and not be moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the affliction of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Right. That doesn't happen when Jesus returns. 
That happens the moment we accept him as our personal savior. And then the start, the transformation begins, the conversion takes place slowly but surely. We are transformed into the likeness of Christ to such a degree that we, as we just read, when Christ comes to get us and presents us to the Father, the Father says, I see no fault in him whatsoever. Just as Pilate declared of Christ, so will God declare of us. Verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which, which worketh in me mightily. So Paul was allowing this work to, to transform. Working in me mightily simply means I'm really fighting with the strength that I have to surrender myself, to allow God's love to move me, to do things that I would turn from and would not want to do otherwise. We have a beautiful, loving God. And everything that he does for us is based and comes forth from a heart of love because he wants us to be with him. He wants us to live forever. He wants us to experience the love that he had before everything was created or anything was created, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That love that they experience, he wants us to experience. And we see this in John chapter 17, where Jesus prays, you know, I want them to be with us, that they may be one as we are one, that we may all be one, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and God's children here on this earth. God has a special place for us in his heart. We are the apple of his eye. And we have this privilege of not being afraid of anything, right? The righteous are as bold as a lion, the Bible says. So we have to begin to allow God's love to move in us, through us, and to speak to other people in such a way that they will see, uh, I've never seen that before in a person, that amount of love. This is unusual. Now we, we know how we can be good and we can be kind, but God's love is different. It's sacrificial to our hurt. And it doesn't broadcast what it's done. It just does it because this is what it does. And eventually someone will see it. And in God's plan, somebody will be moved by it to the point where they will say, I think there's a God. I must give my heart to him. God brings us joy. He gives us peace. He gives us assurance. He gives us promises. Everything that we need to become partakers of the divine nature has been already provided. I say, let's take it. Let's grasp it. Let's move forward and do the work that he's asked us to do. Amen.